So it is seven o'clock by my watch and we have people from all over the world connected in and I'm sure more will join us in the next few minutes. So let me say good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night to people from different parts of the world and thank you for joining us this, this day for this extremely important session. By qualification, I'm a surgeon, so I'm least qualified to say anything about stroke. But perhaps it is appropriate to say that like many of the conditions that we practice in medicine today, stroke is one that requires urgent and appropriate diagnosis in order to prevent the sequelae of stroke, which can be extremely disabling to the patient. So the quicker you diagnose it and the faster you make an accurate diagnosis, the more options that are available for intervention to help improve the condition of the patient rather quickly. So in keeping with that, today's session is likely to be an eye-opener and helpful to many people in understanding how best early diagnosis and diagnosis of stroke can make a difference. We have some excellent speakers, but that is not for me to introduce. That privilege is that of Vinita, and I will introduce today's moderator, Vinita Sharan. Vinita, it's great to have you again. She is the adjunct, adjunct faculty in the Public Health Foundation of India and a senior radiology consultant at Deep Tech. Before this, she was in Manila for many years as associate professor of radiology at San Vida College of Medicine in the Philippines. Thank you everybody for being here this evening and over to you, Vidhi. Yeah. Thank you, Nand Kumar Jairam sir for the introduction. And greetings of the day everyone, whichever part of the world you are in right now. Welcome to Gapio Radiology International Lecture Series. This time the session is on imaging in stroke. And before we start, I would like to request you to send your queries and questions to the chat box. We will have a short question and answer segment at the end of the talk. So as Dr. Jairam said, stroke is very common and very debilitating disease and the faster it is diagnosed, the better. So according to the World Health Organization, Stroke is the most common cause of disability globally, and it is the second common cause of death. And the lifetime risk of developing stroke has increased many folds in the last two decades. And according to the global stroke fact sheet that was released in 2022, one in four persons is likely to develop stroke in their lifetime. And the incidence of stroke in young individuals is even alarming. So timely recognition of symptoms, diagnosis and treatment saves many lives and improves recovery outcomes. FAST, that is the acronym for recognition of the facial arm and speech symptoms and time to immediately call the ambulance. This is being used for raising awareness amongst the general population for early recognition of stroke symptoms and encouraging them to, uh, to seek help as soon as possible in the nearest hospital. So emergency imaging for confirmation of the presence of stroke and also the type of stroke is very important. And computer tomography and magnet magnetic resonance imaging, they have increased the diagnosis time window for early initiation of treatment. Many technological innovations have come in recent times, and today I, we will be hearing from the expert in the field. But before that, I would like to introduce our chairperson, Dr. Guru Prasad Posurkar. 
Dr. Guru Prasad Hosurkar is a senior consultant neurologist at Manipal Hospital, Yaswantpur, Bangalore. He is an active member of Indian Academy of Neurology, Bangalore Neurological Society, and the Indian Medical Association. Dr. Guru Prasad is a trustee and patron of Bangalore Neuroeducation Trust, BNET, and he spearheads their meetings. Dr. Guru Prashad has been actively involved in neurological teaching programs and international clinical drug trials for treatment of Parkinson's disease. I now invite our chairperson, Dr. Guru Prasad Hosurkar, to introduce and invite our speaker for the evening. Dr. Prasad. Uh, doctor, uh, thank you, Dr. Vinita. Uh, for the outset, I would like to thank uh, the office bearers of uh, GAPIO. Uh, especially Dr. Nandkumar Jairam for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to chair the session, a very important session. Uh, as you all understand, uh, the recognition of stroke, uh, the treatment of stroke has uh, you know, made great strides in last three decades. When uh, I was doing my undergraduation uh, you know, 30 years back, uh, uh, we, we didn't have uh, no exposure to CT. So it, it came in late 90s and then soon after we had, uh, you know, clinical trials uh, where uh, thromaletic therapy was uh, you know recognized uh, evidence came about the, then then came the thromaletic therapy era and then the mechanical thromectomy era uh, so the the most important aspect of uh, recognition of stroke is the time so time is brain what we call time is brain so uh, every minute counts every second counts uh, so uh, when we talk about uh, stroke it's uh, I, I i i probably feel that uh, Dr. Gupta will be talking more about acute stroke imaging. Uh, uh, there is also a part where we also look at uh, etiology of stroke in, in uh, you know, in, in uh, strokes which come beyond window period. But uh, as a practicing neurologist, uh, acute stroke imaging is very, very vital because that decides about what is the type of therapy you would provide to the patients. And the stroke burden is huge. So as general practitioners, as physicians and neurologists, we need to be aware of uh, where we stand at this uh, time of uh, uh, the practice and uh, it gives me a great uh, pleasure uh, and privilege to uh, introduce our esteemed speaker for the evening uh, dr rajiv gupta dr rajiv gupta uh, known as dr rajiv gupta has a very versatile and educational uh, professional experience he started his professional education at uh, birla institute of technology uh, pilani india uh, he did his undergraduate and postgraduate courses there and then he went on to uh, State University of New York at Stony Brook uh, to study computer science. He completed his postdoctoral degree in electrical engineering systems from University of Southern California. He pursued medical degree from Cornell University in US. Thereafter, he did his residence in radiology and fellowships in cardiac and neuroradiology from Harvard Medical School, Boston. Uh, he brings about great experience in, in uh, uh, radiology, neuroradiology especially. In his education and professional journey, he has received numerous awards, more than 25 awards, starting from National Science Talent Search Scholarship from 1976 to 1981. He earned the G. Payton Medallion in 1996, G. Management Award for 2.5D Extreme Aging in 1997, Special Five Prize for Innovative Technology in 2002, Royzen Resident Fellow Award in 2004, First Prize, MIT Fourth Annual Ideas Competition in 2005, Best Paper. Stephen A. Kiffer Award in 2007, MIT uh, uh, 100K Dollar Entrepreneurial, Entrepreneurial Competition in 2007, and Image Guided Heli uh, Robotics in uh, 2008. According to PubMed Central, he has more than 214 publications in his name. Currently, Dr. Gupta is a staff neuroradiologist and ER radiologist in the Department of Radiologists at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Associate Professor of Radiology at the Harvard Medical School, and lecturer in Mechanical Engineering at MIT. He's interested in both research and the clinical practice of radiology, currently devoting approximately 50% of his time to each of these activities. He also directs the Advanced X-ray Imaging Sciences Center at Mass General. His research is currently focused on three main topics, development and clinical applications of novel X-ray imaging modalities, including phase contrast imaging, ultra-high resolution computer tomography, dual energy, development of low-cost devices for imaging and image-guided interventions, study of traumatic brain injury using advanced and quantitative MRI techniques. Uh, 
he has traveled uh, you know uh, overnight to be uh, with us for his uh, talk i welcome dr rajiv gupta over to you sir dr hoskar thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you very much to dr sharan as well as to dr jayram uh, for inviting me uh, for this uh, important uh, presentation um i'll be talking maybe for about 40 minutes uh, uh, and uh, and then i'll open it up for questions because i'm sure that there'll be i want to have a discussion and um uh, so so uh, and it's a very basic uh, talk it's um not so much about research it's really about the bread and butter of what everybody should know about stroke imaging so with that let me share my screen and uh, are you able to see my screen yes yes sir yeah. excellent excellent uh so welcome everybody i'll talk about acute ischemic stroke the, this talk is only about ischemic stroke as as you well know there are two types of stroke stroke is a sort of a generic term um there is a hemorrhagic stroke which is about maybe 15% of all the strokes uh, while the majority of strokes are ischemic strokes where there is a uh, a blockage to the the uh, blood supply to the brain so here we we see the the sort of main anterior circulation of the brain you have the internal carotid artery going into the aca and the mca uh, and there is some kind of a blockage and because of that blockage we uh, the brain is exquisitely sensitive to oxygen and within maybe about 20 minutes or, or so the part of the brain parenchyma that is supplied primarily by uh, this artery will proceed to die and this is something that you have to sort of uh, almost accept because very few people unless you have an in hospital stroke uh, very few people will present in that 20 minute time window but there is a much bigger territory surrounding this area which is called penumbra which is being supplied not only by this artery but also by collateral circulation and so the may, which is the now part of brain which is at risk and that's the the entire intervention uh, uh, and uh, Uh, all the processing uh, that we do is really designed to save the penumbra because the cro the, the core of the infarct will be dead dead on arrival essentially for most people so this concept of penumbra is important uh, on the x axis here uh, we are looking at cerebral blood flow measured in amount of how many milli milliliters of blood is flowing in some unit uh, quantity of brain let's say 100 milligrams 100 grams of brain in every minute if that is a let's say from 20 to 50 uh, ml uh, per 100 grams per minute then that's uh, sufficient to sustain normal functioning of the brain this brain would be functioning properly all the sodium potassium channels are working properly the axons are working properly and the neurons are working properly but when the blood flow falls beyond below this value there is this area where brain is ischemic it is alive but non functional uh this is viable tissue if we restore the blood supply it will come back uh and then below a certain point let's say 10 uh, ml per 100 grams per minute we are in the, essentially the, there is so much ischemia that the, the blood flow is not sufficient so this brings us to the the main hypothesis that underlies basis uh, the stroke interventions uh and what basically that says is reopening an occluded vessel saves uh, threatened tissue and improves outcomes in acute ischemic stroke so an open vessel open artery is better than a closed artery that will sound common sensical but once it has to really sort of think about it because there are times when you open a blood blood vessel which was primarily supplying that tissue then there is no point to opening that vessel you can only cause reperfusion injury there is something called reperfusion injury where this high pressure oxygenated blood goes into infarcted tissue and can convert it to an ischemic stroke into a hemorrhagic stroke so this recanalization can be done by intravenous means we can give some th thrombolytic or it can be done by intra arterial means by where we take in a catheter 
and do some version of a thrombectomy. I and mean, we'll talk about both of them. But that's sort of the basic hypothesis and selection of patients as to who are suitable for either the IV or the IA uh, means of treatment is sort of the key central question in stroke uh, uh, imaging and, and in, in stroke uh, care. So here uh, we have uh, the, the internal carotid artery. It comes up to the terminus. You have the anterior cerebral artery going into the A2 and the A3 segments. They all look good. But if you look at the M1 segment of the MCA, there's an abrupt cutoff okay, they, on this angiogram. And you can see the cutoff. So a catheter was put up there and, and the blood circulation was, uh, was reestablished. And that's a very uh, uh, that, that's a common way now uh, to do uh, stroke treatment. So if you look at, uh, so the, it was already mentioned, time is brain, in part because if you look at along the x-axis, we have the time, and along the y-axis, we have the probability of good outcome. As more and more time passes, even if you have successful perfusion, even if the thrombectomy succeeds, it's not a given that you will have an out, a good outcome. And beyond a certain point, uh, you actually, so th these are the cases without reperfusion. So, uh, and these are the cases we, uh, with reperfusion. So even with reperfusion, the probability of good outcome is dependent on time. Late more you wait, less is the probability of a good outcome. So the patient selection becomes very important. There are many options. We can do a non-contrast head CT, uh, which is shown over here, or you can do an MRI. And this is really to exclude hemorrhage. This is to establish that we are looking at an ischemic stroke and not a hemorrhagic stroke. Most people start with a non-contrast head CT, blood is bright on a non-contrast head CT, very simple test for doing it. You can also do a gradient uh, recalled um, image, or you can do also a SWI image to look for blood product within, on an MRI. The next question is, is there a large vessel occlusion? Is there something to treat? And that typically is done by a CT angiogram. You can do a time of flight MRA or a gadolinium enhanced MRA as well. That is mostly not the preferred modality. The most preferred modality is the CT angiogram. On a non-contrast head CT, you can try to assess for, uh, for the size of the ischemic, pin up, uh, ischemic core. Uh, the gray white differentiation is lost in that area. You normally don't see the cortical hyper intense band uh, on, on that. There are scores called aspect scores and so on. But the best method of looking at that is a diffusion weighted image. Okay, so if you want to really see what is the size of the uh, dead brain on arrival, you do an MRI scan and you can measure, assess by DWI. You can also assess for penumbra using some kind of a perfusion imaging or which is the CTP, or you can do a multiphasic CTA and try to assess what is the status of the collaterals. People with good collaterals will have a small penumbra, uh, sorry, will, will have a large penumbra because there is a lot of uh, uh, tissue that is being sustained by these good collaterals. But with people with poor collaterals, the core of the infarct would have actually grown already on arrival to encompass the entire territory, uh, and in which case you'll have a small pin number. And we'll talk about it. So for the longest time, I'll mostly talk about uh, my experience, our 20-year experience at Mass General Hospital. And um, so uh, our, our algorithm uh, until recently has been a non-contrast head CT to establish this hemorrhagic stroke, a CT angiogram, to see where is the large vessel occlusion. And if there is a large vessel occlusion, uh, if the patient is MR capable, there is no hardware, there's no contraindication, we'll do a DWI image. And based on the DWI image, we will look at, go for IA thrombectomy or IVTPA. If the patient is not MR capable, we'll do a CT perfusion to assess the size of the infarct. And even if somebody is having uh, signs of uh, um, uh, strokes and transient ischemic attacks, let's say some transient symptoms that go away, that's a stuttering stroke, essentially. And there's a good case where you, treatment would actually prevent progression into a real bad stroke. So uh, if you, can, you should think of that as the angina of the brain, and you should really treat that aggressively. 
So IVTPA, uh, if you want to do uh, use IVTPA, is there a hemorrhage? That's the main question. If you want to do IF, uh, intra-arterial therapy, you want to know if there's a large vessel occlusion and how much of the brain is already dead. If a lot of brain is already infarcted, you don't want to intervene because you only cause hemorrhagic conversion of the brain. There are other questions within the ischemic penumbra. How much is true at, truly at risk and how much is what is known as benign oligemia? A little bit of a difficult question. Most, the best way of determining the core of the infarct is really to do a diffusion weighted image. But if that is not available, then maybe a CT perfusion can be done. So this was a, uh, an algorithm that we published uh, back in 2013. And we were doing a lot of CT perfusion at that time. And at, uh, the, the day we actually implemented it, this was about 13 years ago, the number of CT perfusions went down. Of late, the number of CT perfusions have gone back up again, and I'll show you the reason. But this is what has been our, our algorithm, non-contrast CT followed by CTA followed by DWI. But because DWI takes time, we are more and more doing CT perfusion. I'll, 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 in the later in the talk, I'll talk about how CT perfusion is done and how it is used. And the, this is what is determined. This is how we go for endovascular therapy. So what's our management pipeline? Patient comes in, we, uh, uh, it is, uh, comes to the ED. It is examined by neurologist. These are two colleagues of mine. They, they do a very detailed uh, and, uh, evaluation to assess if there is, uh, what is the NIH stroke scale. And uh, that gives you a very useful number because it tells you based on symptoms, what is the magnitude of the stroke. The, at the same time, lab work is sent out. And the very first thing we do is a non-contrast head CT. In fact, the time from door to non-contrast head CT is a critical time that is actually monitored. And we want that time to be under 20 minutes uh, in, in most cases. Okay? And, and most of the times we are able to accomplish that. If the patient arrives within time and there is no hemorrhage, uh, within time meaning if, they, if it is in the window for giving a thrombolytic therapy, for example, uh, a TPA. Uh, this has been uh, the, the standard bear for, bearer for a very long time, and, and we'll, we'll give TPA. Uh, but the, the um, effects of TPA have been known for a very long time. Essentially, if you give TPA to a normal person or to a person with stroke, uh, you can dissolve the clot, which is, uh, uh, which is what we want, but you can also cause hemorrhagic conversion of the stroke. So the tissue, which was uh, earlier infarcted, can go on to have in these intraparenchymal hemorrhages. Some places it'll be small, other places, in other people it can be large. And it doesn't have to be in the brain. You can have hemorrhage within the thorax, you can have hemorrhage within the kidneys and the abdomen. So you have this systemic risk for, uh, for hemorrhage uh, while uh, you also have the chance of potentially uh, dissolving the thrombus and reestablishing the blood supply. So this was a trial that was uh, published um, uh, a long time ago, uh, 1995, uh, uh, so several years ago. And uh, this is what forms the basis for stroke in, uh, for TPA therapy. So under three hours, a very high 30% uh, likelihood that patient will have a good outcome. And there is a cohort of patients up to four and a half hours you can give. Uh, and nowadays, the, the window of TPA therapy, uh, thrombolytics, is really up to four and a half hours. So multiple studies have been done in the, uh, in the past comparing different, uh, uh, this is a meta-analysis. This side is all the good outcomes. This is the bad outcomes. And as you can see, most trials vouch for and establish efficacy and benefit from IVTPA when it is properly given within the proper time window. Okay, and this is like almost 7,000 patients who were randomized over these nine trials. And th this graph essentially summarizes what happens when you give TPA. So here we have 100 uh, uh, individuals here. So if you count the number of uh, 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 people uh, mapped here, this 100. The people who are colored in green here, these are the ones who are going to have a benefit. So they will be normal or nearly normal. That's about 13 patients. And about 19 additional patients will be better than when they started. 
So about 32 patients will benefit from the therapy. However, about three patients will have a bad outcome. Uh, about two of them will be worse and one will die because of the hemorrhagic conversion of the stroke. So this is the trade-off that you always deal with. You're talking about benefiting over 30 patients with the understanding that there'll be three patients out of 100 who you may have hurt in, 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 in providing this therapy. If you look at uh, clot burden, uh, if you ask the question, what is the success of TPA? You can see that uh, uh, these, the clot burden has a lot to do with whether you'll successfully recanalize or not. So this is the percentage of, of recanalization when the, the length of the clot, which is on the x-axis here is small. You have pretty good recanalization, but when the clot becomes a centimeter or longer and the clot burden is high, the probability that you'll recanalize just based on uh, giving TPA is, is low. If you look at time dependence, the X, Y axis here is benefit, the X axis is the time. As the time progresses, you can see that the, even though you have given TPA, the probability of benefit decreases. And that's what constitutes the threshold of time, currently four and a half hours, beyond which we typically do not give, uh, give uh, TPA. There are other drugs, there's multiplays and, and so on that are being tried to lengthen and widen this window. But currently that's the, that's the, the, the limitation. If you look at mortality, as the timing goes further and further, if you're giving TPA, the mortality increases. If you look at the probability of converging to hemorrhage as the time increases, the probability of hemorrhagic conversion also increases. So four and a half hours is, is our uh, time window that we currently use. And despite all the, the effort, most patients don't show up and the national trend, it was 5% is, is maybe a little bit higher, but overall TPA utilization is, has remained low primarily because many times the patients to show up in the time window for TPA therapy. So, so the standard uh, uh, of care after that has been intra-arterial stroke therapy. Essentially you have, uh, you put a catheter and somehow try to remove the, the clot. So there are strength retrievers, which are mechanical uh, contraptions that will pull the clot out. And there are suction based removal uh, devices that will uh, take the, uh, through, through vacuum, they will uh, suck the clot out. But no matter how you do it, the, there was a lot of hope when these devices came up that, that they will immediately succeed. Uh, and there were three very famous trials, all published in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which, which are listed here. All of these three trials, the IMS-3, the MR Rescue, and the synthesis trial, all of them failed. So it was kind of uh, very surprising that the the reestablishment of blood flow uh, by IA means was not ha having the, the effect that you will, you will uh, expect, that it will uh, be beneficial to the patient. So no difference in patient outcomes between IV TPA, which was the standard therapy then, and IA therapy, which, is, uh, which was the word using trial. It was come. So, Essentially, what it came to be understood is that reperfusion is not sufficient for good outcome. There are, there are more things. Patient selection is a very important part of, of this, which, has, which cannot be ignored. So there is a variable response to the same treatment, and you have to find that, that group of people who will benefit because you are six, eight, nine hours outside the, uh, beyond the, when, when the, uh, the patient was last well seen. So that is, that has become the key to uh, stroke therapy. How do we find the right patient? That's because there's a highly variable core and penumbra. So he, in the schematic, let's say this is where the thrombus is. This is where the, uh, we have stopped the blood supply. There's a core at presentation and then there's a penumbra. Okay. So, uh, different people have different levels of collateralization of this territory. There may be no collateralization, essentially the ACA and the MC are completely different, or there can be very good collateralization. There are also systemic collaterals that can supply the, the therapy. And the state of those collaterals is what determines how, uh, how well you will do. So the time is, is brain is probably right, 
but collaterals are brain is, is a more accurate description, okay? Uh, this is the reason the BP and the volume support in the acute care, uh, case because uh, you, you can do other therapies, uh, blood pressure monitoring and, and other supportive therapies, and you can improve the patient based on the collaterals. So here is an example. Here's a patient who is eight hours after the onset of, of stroke, after eight hours after ictus, 79-year-old female with right hemiparesis and, and seizures with a complete uh, occlusion uh, of the ICA terminus. So this is a T, a T lesion, both the AC and the, uh, the MC are down. Here, what we see is a very small infarct, okay, in the MCA territory. The ACA territory actually seems to be almost good because of the collateral. So this is a T lesion with a small stroke after eight hours. Here we have another patient, 74-year-old male with right hemiparesis and aphasia, also with an ICA T lesion. The terminus is, we have a complete occlusion at the terminus of the internal carotid artery, and the entire MCA territory is infarcted. Okay, and some of the ACA territory is also infarcted. And the reason here is because this patient has very poor collaterals. So even though we are very close to the, to the window, we are in the, within the TPA window, if you will, there is very, there is very little penumbra to salvage. The entire territory of the MCA uh, and tear circulation, in fact, on the, on the, uh, right, uh, on the left side are, are stroked out. So the main lesson uh, of the, the failed trials were choose your patient wisely. Okay, so, so these, uh, these two trials did not mandate vessel imaging. There was, uh, was many of the times there is not even an LDO and all those things really were, uh, what caused the failure of those first three early trials. With the, based on these lessons, there, was, uh, there were five trials or more in succession, all published in New England Journal of Medicine that established that with proper selection of patients using imaging and radiology becomes key to this, this entire exercise, you can have benefit from stroke therapy or from intra-arterial therapy. Okay, so these are all the trials, all positive. They show benefit of endovascular therapy with IVTP over IVTP alone. So that was uh, over the standard of care for stroke and proximal vessel occlusion. Okay, so the most, so one of the most significant advances in stroke care um, uh, since 1990s. And what as now we know is the number needed to treat is one of the highest. So in heart attacks, in other diseases, you treat five, 10, 20 patients and may benefit some of them. Here, the numbers are very low. You treat two to three patients and one of them will, will have good outcomes. So very high, um, uh, very efficacious uh, overall pr profile. So these were the IA trials. Mr. Clean was done in uh, Netherlands, IA Extend, Escape, uh, Calgary. We have MGH. We pro proved based on, uh, on DWI that, that you can get good outcomes done and diffuse these with the, the standard bearers. And this is what really resulted in, in acceptance of IA therapy, intra-arterial therapy uh, for stroke imaging. So we, most, uh, we have been using diffusion-weighted imaging for, for a very long time. This is before all these trials were published. And what we showed was that the good outcome in versus recanalization has the, what you will expect. So if there is good perfusion, the, uh, the patients, do better. This is a three-month uh, modified Duncan Ray uh, scale. So whenever you are able to reach sticky 3B3, there's 60%, 64% probability of having a good three-month outcome. And same for tiki 2A. If you look at mortality versus recanalization, with greater reperfusion, you have less mortality as is to be expected. So this is kind of what uh, forms the basis of what, what we're talking about. If you have a core and if you have, this is the hyperperfused territory, the, the rate at which the core is growing, every minute the core is becoming bigger and bigger. The rate at which it is growing is really based on what is the ischemic intensity or the intensity of the ischemia, which is based on collateral. So if you look at, um, the, this is a closed circuit. Uh, if you have a small core, 
And if you have good, uh, that by, by definition means you have good collaterals because you're imaging this patient two hours, three hours after, there's no way ischemic brain, completely ischemic brain would have survived. So the fact that you are, somebody is presenting with a small core is an implicit uh, acceptance of the fact that this person has good collaterals. That means he will have a large penumbra and there'll be a large mismatch. So this will be a good candidate to treat. The, you don't really need to measure penumbra. Just the very fact that somebody has a small core uh, tells you that the patient has a large penumbra and good mismatch profile. So at MGH, we empirically determined the threshold of 70 ml, and this number has become a worldwide standard. People regard this as the cutoff between those who have a good outcome versus those who will have a poor outcome. So this, uh, this patient with uh, uh, less than 70 ml of uh, infarcted territory at presentation will have a high probability of good outcome with embolectomy. Patients over 100 ml will have less than 5% chance of having a good outcome. So we use these numbers uh, routinely in our practice. Uh, either with DWI or with CT perfusion, we determine what the size of the core is. If the core is less than 70 cc's, we typically will take the patient to uh, uh, for the therapy, IA therapy. On the other hand, if there is more than 100 ml, we will try not to unless uh, there are other considerations. And so you can have DWI as the measure of what is the infarcted territory, uh, which takes time. It adds about 30 minutes to your, your um, adds in 30 minute delay to your processing. Or you can go to CT perfusion. It lacks precision because CT perfusion just tells you the state of plumbing. It doesn't really tell you about the vitality of the tissue. We have published our results. Uh, this was a paper that came out uh, a few years ago, uh, which showed essentially uh, uh, the results of our observational trial. We, we imaged about 103 patients, 72 with uh, CTA, uh, CT, CTA followed by DWI. So the estimation of the core was done using DWI, while the others, uh, we could establish them with good circulation, good collaterals. And based on that, we, we took the patient for therapy. So, um, People with, who are likely to benefit less than 70 uh, cc's of infarctor brain, they had, they had a growing puncture within six hours. And those who are unlikely to benefit, they had a growing uncertain benefit about eight hours. And we looked at the three month uh, outcomes, Bordify Rankin scale, whether they're living independently or not at 90 days. And if you, this is kind of summarizes what the, what the scoring system is here. So, you can have this uh, MRS of one, two, or three, which is sort of considered good outcome. Six is, is poor outcomes. And if you see those who failed reperfusion, okay, for whatever reason, they could not be reperfused, a lot of bad, uh, uh, bad outcomes. But with this success, uh, successful reperfusion, essentially the amount of this dark black is decreasing. You're really having good outcomes, zero, one, two, or three in majority of the patients. So this is, uh, so patients likely to benefit have a 75% probability of favorable outcome with successful embolectomy. MRI used results in higher treated to screen ratio. And there's no relationship uh, between the outcome and the time from stroke onset to, to reperfusion. So these are some of the outcomes of, the, of this uh, uh, study. We, uh, let me show you a case. We, uh, we typically use a non-contrast head CT to rule out hemorrhage. We do a CT angiogram to establish that there is actually something to treat, that there's a large vessel occlusion. And we use DWI to, this is your rule in, if you, if you will. And to rule out the, the, the patient must have a profile that he or she is likely to benefit. So we want to make sure that the at presentation, the core is small and there's a large amount of pin number to salvage uh, using IA therapy. So this is, uh, our very simple binded algorithm that we use. Uh, and this is the, the use as, as a rule out criteria. So this was a case that was published, uh, a, a young uh, woman uh, with sudden hemiplegia and aphasia during a transatlantic flight. The patient was straight brought from the Logan airport to MGH. Um, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this was kind of the, the presentation and I scored uh, of, of a stroke scale of about 14. 
And what we see is this hyperdense vessel sign. So the clot is hyperdense, and you can see that on a non-contrast head CT. And you can also see the loss of gray-white differentiation in the subinsular white matter. So everywhere else, as you can see, the cortical ribbon is intact uh, on this side as well. But here, the cortical ribbon is lost. And that gives you a, uh, a sense of how big the, the, the stroke is. The patient went on to have a DWI. And you can see that there is very small area of DWI abnormality. Patient was taken to IA therapy, you can see the, uh, the artery here, you can see the cutoff, the, the, we were able to establish the, uh, the uh, so there's essentially no flow here. Okay? And then the patient went on, they were, they were successful, and as you can see, now the entire MCA territory as well as the ACA territory have been reestablished. And you can almost see that there is ACA to MCA collaterals here. If you went a little bit later, this, you can see more of a communication between the ACA and the MCA territory. And that was the reason why this patient had a, a small infarct at presentation. So this is a, a delayed image. You can see that there's very little infarct and, and this patient essentially walked out. Um, this was a very good outcome. So if I were to summarize the IA therapy, endovascular therapy is the most effective treatment for patients with acute stroke uh, persisting uh, presenting with, the, with large vessel occlusion. This is currently the standard of care, AHA, and all the guidelines essentially ask for it. Embolectomy is time critical. It's a team effort. Uh, the clock starts ticking the moment patient shows up uh, in, the, in the emergency room. We have a whole sort of pager system uh, uh, we, we invoke. Imaging-based patient selection is the key. And there are still sort of divergent opinions about what's the right way of selecting the patient we believe in DWI, but we have succumbed to using CTP. Other people just use CTP. There are people who use only collaterals, but the selection of the patients is key to, to success in this particular endeavor. So we used to have a uh, less than six hours. We had an ED to CT page where we'll do a CT CTA. And we, uh, if the patient is presenting after six hours, we'll do an ED to MR and the patient will start the processing on the MR. But there are issues with the MR-based protocol. MRI takes long. Some people cannot have MRI. Clearing uh, the MRI uh, uh, can, can take time. So our protocol was sort of complex. And, and uh, the, the central dogma, which has sort of come to uh, take hold in stroke community is that you can get a good sense of diffusion perfusion mismatch using CTP. So CTP uh, can tell you what is the size of the core and the pin number. Okay, so uh, you see, uh, th this is sort of a CT-based protocol for doing uh, stroke imaging. So it's important to understand how CT perfusion works. So I will maybe spend uh, three, four, five minutes to explain what the, what the CT perfusion is. So here is a uh, CT slice to the brain. We, this side is normal. As you can see, the, the cortex, which has very high uh, blood flow, is, is bright. And then this is the ischemic side. So there is some kind of a, a blockage on the anterior circulation on the left-hand side. So this, is, this voxel is in the ischemic territory. This, this particular circle, this region of interest, is telling you a vessel. It tells you how the contrast comes in and goes out. It gives you the kinetics of the bolus itself. And then this is uh, on the normal brain parenchyma. So if you look at the arterial input function, you will see that there is no contrast. The contrast suddenly comes in and then it washes out. This is the arterial input function. It goes into the, uh, and then you have recirculation after a certain time. And, and, and then maybe, let's go back here. And then if you waited long enough, you'll get a smaller peak and, and, and so on. And then you'll get sort of a flat line. This is what how a typical artery would work. This is the green curve here shows you how the normal tissue would function. Essentially, as the artery, it'll lag the arterial input function a little bit. The contrast will come in. It will perfuse into the brain parenchyma. And then it will also show this little bump. If you look at the ischemic territory, the ischemic territory is not being supplied directly from an artery. It is primarily being supplied from collaterals. So 
there'll be delay in the arrival of the contrast. So this blue curve will lag even the green curve and it will not go as high because there is ischemia there. And then you'll get maybe a small bump for reperfusion. All of stroke perfusion, and all of the CT perfusion numbers that we talk about are really quantitation of this curve. This is called a time opacification curve. So if you look at the time opacification curve, you can ask the question from the borderless arrival, how fast does the contrast uh, rise in? And that gives you a sense of how fast the blood is flowing into that voxel. You can look at the area under this curve and that tells you how much volume of blood is coming into this voxel. You can ask the question of when does, do I get a peak in, in my uh, time of pacification curve? And that tells you whether the blood flow into this voxel is delayed or not delayed. So these are some of the parameters that we measure. We measure cerebral blood flow of, of volume, which is CBV. We measure mean transit time, MTT, and we can divide the one from the other and we can ask the question of what is the cerebral blood flow? How much blood is flowing into this voxel? The usual method, I mean, you can ignore this, but essentially what you, we used to do was we would put a slab and we'll acquire many, many images over time, over this slab. Sometimes we'll put two slabs, give more contrast. We'll give 40 cc for one slab, 40 cc for another slab. And, and, and we'll acquire over, let's say one minute period, the, the entire slab and ask the, we'll measure, uh, we'll plot those time of pacification curves. And then for each voxel in the image territory, we will measure the CBF, the CBV and the mean transit time. That has changed now because the scanners have become faster. So most scanners will <clears throat> scan the entire brain and we, we use something called a shuttle mode, which is shown over here. So essentially we acquire one data set uh, we inject contrast, going down we acquire a data set, we're going up we acquire a data set, and this is done at let's say one to two seconds uh, for every <clears throat> uh, acquisition of the entire brain parenchyma, and is done at a high uh, speed in the arterial uh, phase. So each one of these lines is acquisition of a full volume of the brain. Once you go out to like 60 seconds or 45 seconds, you're in the venous phase in the brain, Perfusion is not changing very fast. So we drop down the frequency. There's no point in irradiating and acquiring, getting the same data set. So we sample the, the brain parenchyma less frequently, but overall we go to about 65 seconds or more and see how the blood is flowing in and flowing out into every voxel. We plot time of pacification curves and then using those we uh, find the CBV, CBF, MTT, um, Tmax, and so on. All this is done by automated software. It's important to understand what we're doing, but the actual math of it is really being uh, done automatically. So um, there are some pitfalls. You have to go out. So for example, in this case, we did not go out enough. So we, we truncated the curve, and because of the truncation of the curve, even though there is no arterial occlusion, uh, it looks like this entire area is, is uh, hypoperfuse because maybe there is some proximal stenosis in the artery or whatever. There is a delay in the arrival of the, uh, of the blood, but it is not ischemic. It is just because of occlusion. It is not, it's not a, um, so this is one pitfall. The usual thing is you, you want to you be close to the K-edge of iodine, which is about 34, to get good opacification. So you want to use low KVP and not high KVP. Also, you should not use your regular standard non-contrast head CT and acquire, acquire it 60, 70 times, because they'll be too high in radiation dose. So you want to use very low MA. You want to have sufficient temporary resolution, go out 65 seconds or more. Don't truncate the time of pacification curves and don't overinterpret CTP maps. They are an approximation of what the plumbing in the brain is. And this sort of give you a gestalt of what is hyperperfused. So this is our current protocol. Patients come in, we do a CT, CTA, and CTP. <clears throat> and if the patient is less than four and a half hours, they'll go for uh, IV TPA and then make, uh, can go for treatment. Is it greater than uh, that? And if there's a larger occlusion, again, they can uh, 
uh, they will typically go for uh, some kind of a therapy. If the patient is not a candidate, we'll consider MRI. If the patient is coming from where we have already an outside imaging and patient is late, then we may start the protocol on the MR side. So this is kind of our overall protocol. Here is an example, the patient, you can see the large ischemic territory here. There is no hemorrhage in this territory. Uh, we see that there is a large uh, uh, defect in the CBF and this uh, an empty TMAP. The patient went on to have thrombectomy. There was an entire cutoff. We were able to reestablish the blood flow. And based on this, uh, maybe a stent was deployed, but you can see nice uh, uh, reestablishment of the blood flow. And then the patient has a very, very good outcome. You can kind of see the, where the stent is. Okay. And, and this is, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, post intraarterial therapy, there is essentially no defect in the, in the, in the perfusion maps. So in summary, perfusion show, uh, shows the state of plumbing and is not, uh, for, uh, doesn't show you tissue viability. Perfusion cannot replace DWI, however, it can be used to guide decision making. So I've given you a, an overview of what acute stroke is, what are the criteria we use for patient selection, and that the fact that patient selection is key, and what are the various choices, and how you can configure a stroke algorithm, stroke triage algorithm that works for your hospital. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll open it up for, for questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, for an elaborate and exhaustive uh, talk on uh, imaging in stroke and covering uh, most of the aspects of uh, imaging in stroke. We have one question from the audience uh, regarding uh, the difference between CT and MR examination for acute stroke. Yeah, so CT... Um... Just speaking generally, CT is essential. Okay, CT is a simple, easy to do test. In non contrast head CT is a requirement, uh, at least in the US. Somebody comes in with a stroke, the very first thing to do is non contrast head CT to establish that there is no hemorrhage because TPA, all those things, you, you'll kill a patient if you, if you gave TPA to somebody who's having hemorrhage in the brain. So there are also lots of stroke mimics. Some people have uh, tumors and, and some people have other issues uh, which can give, look like stroke. So the truth is that every day, maybe five, six times or, or more, we will invoke the stroke pager. The number of people who actually have stroke after we do the CT, CTA is like one in five, one in 10, smallish number, okay? So our um, neurological examinations are, are not that precise in, in terms of whether is it a tumor, is it a stroke, what kind of stroke it is, or something else going on. Um, so doing a, a non-contrast head CT and CT angiogram, which is the simplest thing one can do, is, is an absolute requirement to some extent. You can, if you don't want to be fancy, you can do a multiphasic uh, CT angiogram. You can do an arterial phase, a venous phase, a delayed phase, and try to see how good are the collaterals. And you can use that for, for decision-making. But at that time, it is essential to establish how much, uh, what's the burden of, uh, of infarcted territory. Is it a huge stroke or is it a, is a small stroke? If it's, let's say, more than a third of the MCA territory is involved, doing any kind of intervention would be futile, okay? In which case you, um, and, and sometimes early in the stroke in non-contrast head CT can be difficult to see what size, what's the size of the stroke. That's where a DWI image and MR helps. But you can also do CT perfusion, which is a CT-based test, most, more available, can be done much more quickly. Uh, but you will need software to process the CTP. There are web-based softwares, cloud-based softwares, Rapid and Wiz, we use Wiz. We also have Rapid available for, um, for um, some of the trials that we are running. Uh, the single VIA, there are like at least 12 different programs that are uh, available for doing the processing. One of the unfortunate truths though is 
if you use different programs for CT perfusion, they all give you slightly different results. And uh, it may or may not matter from a triage point of view, but one has to be cognizant that the estimation of cores using CT perfusion is much less precise than that from a DWI. Okay, the, the error could be like 30, 40 cc's plus minus. You have done some numbers and we are in the process of submitting a paper just on that topic. But it's a, it's a if, if you don't have DWI available, the patient has contraindications for, for doing MR imaging, CTP is a good alternative to assess the state of perfusion within the brain. So that, that would be my, my sort of recommendation, but it also depends on what your uh, demographics is. When do the patients show up? If the patients are showing up a day late, two days late, the whole picture changes because everything that I talked about is really not, earlier the stroke window used to be four and a half hours, the TPA window. Then it became six hours. Then with refuse and dawn, it has become 24 hours. So very late window stroke is a, is a completely different beast than, than the early acute stroke. More questions. Yeah, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I mean, it's really very detailed, and I think I think everyone, whether radiologist, neurologist, or any uh, subspeciality, I think it was very clear for everyone. So I think for take home from this, would you say that even if it is within the stroke window like less than six hours like less than 4.5 hours anytime one has to give a tpa one will have to wait for the volume of brain uh, damage or the collaterals you, i mean you 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 have to have a sense of how big the so first of all you are within four and a half hours mm -hmm. you establish that there is no hemorrhage if you give tpa where you have some sense that it's a very large stroke, either on an NI stroke scale, or because the gray-white differentiation is lost, or the collateral pattern on your CT angiogram is what is known as a malignant pattern. There's essentially no collaterals. Then it is. it may be a futile attempt in that you may convert, you will, uh, you'll hurt the patient, uh, and the, the threshold that has been used is uh, you have to have a stroke size, the core size, less than one third of the MCA territory in order to dictate Okay, thank you. So, I think there are some more there questions. Is, yeah, there's a related question. Uh, Dr. Ramani KVN has asked whether the core volume can only be assessed by MRI. Uh, no, no. So, so um, perfusion gives you a method of uh, assessing core. Actually, it gives you a number. There's something called CD. So, whenever the CBF is less than uh, thirty percent of the contralateral side, by convention and by empiric evidence, we assume we believe that that's the size of the infarcted territory. It has some bounds about plus minus thirty cc's, I would say, but that's a good estimate for of a stroke. Sometimes you can see the, the area where the gray-white differentiation is lost. You can measure the length, width, and the, the height. So the ma three major axes, a, a simple method of estimating the volume is what is known as the ellipsoidal rule. So you A, B, C divided by two. So if A is, is one major axis, B is the other axis, C is the third major dimension, you multiply by the three and divide by two. That's a, a good approximation to in MLs, what is the size of the of the stroke? So, DWI MR is is a good method of doing it. Uh, it's an it's a much more accurate method of doing it. But the, there are approximations that one can use. You, you're muted, sir. Sorry, Dr. Yeah, how, much, yeah. how much time do we have for questions? Uh, any time I, limit? I think. I think we can take a few more and then we can wrap up. Yeah. 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 So yeah. from my side, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, so for example, uh, if a center has MRI, you know, uh, based uh, thrombolytic, I mean, MRI based stroke protocol, uh, what would you uh, tell the technician or the radiology group to minimize the time? Ultimately, it's the, the problem with MRI is one thing is the patient cooperation. 
and other thing is uh, the duration of the imaging. Uh, so in our center, we do MRI guided uh, stroke protocol. Uh, so we strive to keep it less than 10 minutes. So uh, how will you I think or what are the basic sequences required for uh, for information regarding acute stroke? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Our protocol, um, we have this acute stroke protocol, which is very, very fast. Essentially, what we do is we do a scout, typically a SAG T1. We will do a DWI image, which is a two and a half minute sequence. Okay, so, so it's not this high resolution 64 direction diffusion weighted image. It's essentially 28 directions, three B0 values in, in 25 directions, two and a half minutes total. That comes, uh, and, and then we do a flare image. Uh, and, and that's basically it. We, we typically will add a GRE sequence of some sort to look at hemorrhagic conversion. And th that's the entire sequence. Okay, we can, there's a lot more that can be done. But it's better better to be quick and 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 not be exhaustive in your in your MR imaging. Um, people can add a time of flight three um, D time of flight sequence to it. That's about a two and a half minute sequence. Uh, uh, but if you've done a CT CTA, you know you have a better test of the of the vasculature. So there's no point in repeating that. So that's kind of so the the, the ten minutes you have is actually a good sequence. I would I would stick to that. Uh, there is also uh, some amount of uh, thing uh, reluctance to use CT angio without creatinine. So uh, good that you, you, you in your slide you presented the only blood test what is required is the sugar. I think the most yeah. important driving point is that mm -hmm. you don't need require right. creatinine for uh, thing because saving brain is very important. Uh, right. The developing uh, renal failure related to contrast which is used in CT angio is very very minimal. So mm -hmm. so you want to comment on that, sir? Yes. So essentially, uh, in, in, we send out a creatinine, but we don't wait for it. Okay. When we do the blood draw, uh, we, we do not wait for the creatinine. And uh, and the, and the truth is, pa pa patients can be dialyzed. Patients can be. Uh, there are other ways of improving uh, their, their their renal health. Uh, they are in an acute situation right now. Saving the brain is more important. And just as you said. I think there is one question who, uh, asking, how do we rule out LVO, the large volume of closure? Large vessel occlusion. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, the, the easiest way of, of doing an LVO uh, is, is really a CT angiogram. CT angiogram is a very good test for showing the, and we do not only the head, but we do the entire neck. So from the arch all the way up to the vertex, we, we do a CT angiogram. Typical CT angiogram would be in the arterial phase and a slightly delayed scan because some people have very tight stenosis with a hairline lumen. So a completely occluded artery is treated very differently from a slightly open artery. Okay? And sometimes because the blood flow is so slow through a hairline lumen, in the arterial phase, you may not see it. It may look like it's completely occluded. So having a delayed scan is important. And the delayed scan also gives you a sense of how good are the collaterals. So you have two benefits of, of, of that delayed scan. And so that's our, our protocol. We do a CT, non-contrast head CT, followed by an arterial phase CTA, which is at about 30 seconds after the contrast injection. And then we're just like the delayed more like 45 uh, uh, seconds after the contrast injection. And th that is the entire protocol takes less than five minutes overall, to be honest. And, and the patient is in and out very, very quickly. At that time, if we see a large vessel occlusion, we make the determination, are we going to do a CT perfusion or not? And we, we, we use this automated software where the scan that is done is pushed to the cloud. And then uh, after, uh, the, while we are looking at the imaging, um, let me see if I can show you. Um, so this is a program that we use. Uh, it's called WIS. Other people use uh, other programs. and. So, for example, this was a case which, which was done just now, okay? And, and I can look at it uh, on, on, on my... Um, so, this is a... In, uh, I, I don't know if you can see. This is a non-contrast head CT, and I, I, can, I can sort of look at it and, and go through it on, 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 my, on my iPhone, okay? And then it also... Uh, we do a CT angiogram. 
So, so this was the CT angiogram that was done. And the program tells me within five minutes, is there a large vessel occlusion or not? Okay. And, and so this is sort of automatic, uh, sort of uh, this patient doesn't have an LVO. This patient essentially either has a very small stroke and I think there's nothing to treat. Uh, uh, even if you don't have this software, it takes some time, but within like, you can very quickly, you can establish the larger cell occlusion or not. So I would say CT angiogram is the best test for it. Uh, many times what happens is you give a TPA, you take the patient to the cath lab, and when you inject, the, the clot has been dissolved or, or there's, uh, there's nothing to treat. But you, the, you will know that only in, in the cath lab. And, and that, that, that's a good outcome. You, essentially, the patient has treated himself or herself. I think we have a few more questions, probably take one or two more and then... Sure, sure, sure. Take your time. Yeah, I'm, I'm here and people are here, so okay. we're having fun. So we have uh, Saeed Sadat. He's asking, why repeat CT after 24 hours and DWI sequence after 48 hours in stroke patients? So CT angiogram after 24 hours. There are no hard and fast rules like that, to be honest. Okay, that uh, that is really to assess how effective your therapy has been over 24 hours and 48 hours. You want to know what the size of the stroke is and so on. So those are more of a post um, post procedure surveillance test. And uh, uh, even when you sort of uh, treat uh, the, the, the uh, white thrombectomy or by other means, you, you treat the LVO, large vessel occlusion, people have a tendency to re-occlude and then you, you will be able to find that. Some people will have hemorrhagic conversion and you will be able to find that. What also happens is whenever you do, this is an important point actually. Somebody comes in, had a large vessel occlusion, you put in a catheter, you're giving contrast, you're seeing where the blockage is, you work there for 20 minutes, you are sort of are able to do a thrombectomy using a stent retriever or something. So much contrast is given directly at the site of where the occlusion was. And then when the occlusion has been resolved, you are giving undiluted contrast in the part of the brain parenchyma that is already infarcted. This area, the blood brain barrier has broken down. Because the blood brain barrier has broken down, this is a leaky parenchyma. So much of the contrast that you will give will extravasate into the interstitial space and will be visible on a non-contrast head CT. So if you do, did a thrombectomy and you brought the patient to the CT, CT again, you will see this very large um, uh, hyperdense area in your CTA. It looks like, my God, I've killed this patient. This is entire hemorrhage. But that's not the case. That is all leaked out contrast. Contrast is water soluble. So if you give time, the contrast, the blood would sort of re-dissolve and the kidneys will ex excrete it out. The rule of thumb has been that within 24 hours, just about all the contrast should wash out. A few years ago, I did a study as to what is the half washout time of hemorrhage in the brain and what is the half washout time of contrast? By half washout time, I mean, if you have certain intensity of uh, hyperdensity in the brain, how long do I wait uh, when the intensity will become half, it is contrast versus when it is blood? And it's, this is an important number to know. The half washout time of contrast in the brain parenchyma is about eight hours, which means, if there is certain intensity of contrast uh, straining in the brain parenchyma, you wait eight hours, it'll be half as bright. You wait another uh, eight hours, it'll be further half as bright. If you wait another, it'll be an eighth as bright. So in 24 hours, you are given enough time for the contrast to wash out. And that tells you, is there hemorrhagic conversion or not? Okay. Um, if you, on the, on the other hand, blood stays there in the brain for a very long time, okay, for days. The half washout time for blood in the brain is about 10 days, okay? And there, there'll be edema around it. But if you repeated the scan, if somebody has intraparenchymal hemorrhage, eight hours later, look about the same. You still have some more edema around it. You may have some brain shift and so on. You look about the same. So that is the conventional method of assessing is there hemorrhagic conversion or not, 
by repeating a scan 24 hours later. There's a newer method of doing this, which is using dual energy. So we published uh, on a single energy scan, you, all, you, you have no way of distinguishing hemorrhage and iodine. On a dual energy scan, you can tell for each voxel how much iodine is there and how much hemorrhage is there. So you can do this virtual non-contrast images and all the hemorrhage will show up on a virtual non-contrast image. So you don't have to wait 24 hours. You can actually do at the presentation right after thrombectomy. Uh, so we, we, we do this scan, uh, this, this is our standard of care. We try to bring the patient uh, to a dual energy scanner um, and, and try to assess whether there's hemorrhagic conversion or not. We also have a portable scanner from a company called Neurologica, which is a, a photon counting uh, multispectral scanner. And this, this, is a, this scanner can be taken to the patient. So the, you pop the head out a little bit and the scanner moves on the ground around the patient and is able to scan the brain. So in neuro ICU, we are able to do uh, a, a, a multispectral head, um, head non-contrast head CT. And we sometimes use that to assess is that hemorrhagic conversion or not. So I hope that that kind of answers the question as to why 24 hour scan and, and, and so on. These are sort of the considerations, but you have to uh, optimize protocol based on what, what's available to you. So speaking about Indian uh, you know, experience also is that, you know, we also keep seeing, uh, you know, venous thrombosis. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so as much as imaging is so important, clinical assessment is very important in the emergency. Uh, because if you don't have an objective, uh, you know, measurable neurological deficits, uh, that means by, by nature of doing NH uh, stroke score, uh, you will not be able to pinpoint. So you will have some atypical presentations where there are patients comes with headaches and then seizures and then has deficits. Uh, so sometimes you'll have to extend your uh, imaging to include venogram. So, uh, uh, so what will you, uh, how will you, uh, you know, extend that whether you need a contrast or just a plain of venogram is good enough, sir. So um, non-contrast head CT there is required just to see the hemorrhage. In any stroke workup, we'll do a, 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 um, a CT angiogram and a delayed angiogram. So the delayed angiogram is the, the circ transit time through the brain is very, very quick. The brain is a low resistance circuit. So if I put a blush of contrast on the in the ICA, within five seconds, that contrast would be on the venous side. So when we are doing imaging at in the peak of arterial phase, there is some venous contamination. But when you do the delayed imaging at 45, 46 seconds, you get a fairly good venogram. So that's another reason for why do the delayed. You, you do the delay to rule out hairline lumen. You do the delay to assess the collaterals. You also do the delayed imaging to get a good venogram. I think the topic is so interesting that we can go on and on, but I think at some point we have to give it an end. So if um, probably we will uh, end the session now, I want to mm -hmm. thank you, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, so much for giving us such precious time and information. And I think it has been really wonderful for everyone to get so much of information. Thank you so much. And yes. Thank you very much for hosting me. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Sure. Yeah. And so thank let me take the privilege of uh, not only thanking Rajiv, which you've already done, Vinita, yeah. but also thanking you for consistently helping us in this program. And for my dear friend, Guru, Guru Prasad, for sparing his time on a weekend to do this session. And of course, to all the participants uh, who have joined us, because that's ultimately why we do all these sessions. But uh, Rajiv, I must say this, I'm a surgeon by qualification. And so very distant from your speciality, but I can assure you that I understood every single bit of what you said. Kudos to you. Thanks again. Yeah. Dr. Jairam, that was very high compliment. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye mm -hmm. now. Thank Have you, a good sir. night.
So we also thank all the uh, participants again. And with this, I end the session. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.